This girl, Susan, is seeing a psychotherapist for the first time. Not because she wants to. Her parents insisted. Susan's having trouble at home, at school. Even her friends can't get along with her anymore. Susan isn't happy, but she doesn't think she needs a psychotherapist. I see everybody else being really smooth, you know? Uh, no hassles. And really getting into things and getting excited. And I, I sit around unhappy on this huge bummer. But I don't think that I need a shrink. All I need, I just need somebody that I could talk to, somebody that I can trust. That's my job, Sue. I know. I just mean that if I start going to a shrink, a doctor, I mean, people are going to think I'm crazy or something. Is that the only reason you don't want to see a therapist? I right, look. Tell me what you're feeling right now. I was, um... I was just flashing on the reason why I didn't want to do this. Was, um... Because... I was afraid that you would find out something... Really... Um, awful and, and terrible ab about me and that I was crazy, you know, um, because, I mean, sometimes I think I'm really going crazy. You know what I mean? I mean, sometimes it fills up and No, it gets, it gets bad. Susan says she lives in a world where everyone seems just fine, except herself. Well, she's wrong. She may think she's the only troubled person in the world, but in fact, there are millions of people who suffer from what has been called simply mental illness. Today, psychologists use a variety of names, from emotional disorders to abnormal functioning because they've realized that there's no single condition they can call mental illness. There are many psychological problems and many troubled people wondering who can help them. The most serious psychological disorders, like schizophrenia, distort the sufferers' minds so badly that they can no longer function in the everyday world. Alcoholism and drug addiction can also cripple their victims' lives. But because their problems are so serious, schizophrenics and addicts can get help at many hospitals and clinics. But what about the others? People like Susan. People like you and me. Millions of people aren't schizophrenic or problem drinkers or addicts but they still suffer deeply from psychological pain. These people don't need hospitals. They seem to get along fine in the world, but their own minds may be crying out for help. If the cry gets loud enough, they look for psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is a method of treating the problems of the mind. But many people whose problems lead them to seek help soon discover that there are many forms of psychotherapy. They use differing techniques. This is the oldest and probably the most popular therapeutic method in history. 
This South American witch doctor is treating an American explorer for a mysterious pain. Doctors in New York were unable to explain it, but the witch doctor can. The explorer has been possessed by a demon. <laughs> The witch doctor summons the healing gods to one of humanity's oldest rituals, an exorcism. With the help of the gods, he will drive the demon from the explorer's soul. Psychotherapy by exorcism hasn't always been limited to primitive cultures. Until the 18th century, European exorcists literally beat the devil out of anyone whose behavior was at all unusual. Since people with psychological problems were thought to be possessed by the devil, they were feared by the entire community. Many were burned as witches or driven into the countryside. Early mental hospitals began treating sufferers as patients rather than agents of Satan. But often they were little better than prisons. They isolated even mildly disturbed people for the good of the community. They made few attempts to treat individual problems. All mentally troubled people were still one group apart until a new method of psychotherapy came to the rescue of the individual sufferer. The new method was the brainchild of Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis. Freud's method was the first alternative for the many sufferers he called neurotics, people who led normal lives but were psychologically disturbed. His Vienna offices were distinguished by what became the trademark of psychoanalytic therapy, an overstuffed chair for Dr. Freud, a comfortable couch for the patient. During the heyday of their method in the 1930s and 40s, many psychoanalysts treated patients in the same couch and chair arrangement. Freud insisted that the psychoanalytic therapy be a rigorous discipline. By sitting behind patients, analysts avoided influencing them with looks of approval or disapproval as they began psychoanalytic treatment. Psychoanalysis emphasizes that a patient's past emotional experiences hold the key to any present disturbances. That past begins with the moment of birth and is dominated in the earliest years by the primary influence of the parents. When children go out into the world, their minds are already molded by their parents. In fact, Freud believed that by the age of five, everyone's basic personality was fixed for life. In later youth, we learn to further adapt ourselves to society so we can live and work in the adult world. But Freud pointed out that this adaptation process is often very painful especially if we're badly treated as children by our parents or others. He realized that most adults had a lifetime of painful moments repressed in their unconscious minds, and that this pain created inner conflicts, which probably caused most psychological suffering. Freud used several techniques to discover his patient's conflicts. One was the analysis of dreams. Dreams, said Freud, are the royal road to the unconscious. He believed that the seemingly incomprehensible events of dreams were in fact a series of symbolic images. These images, if properly interpreted, could reveal better than anything else the unconscious conflicts in a patient's mind. Everything too painful or too improper for a patient to consciously admit nevertheless demanded expression in dreams. Psychoanalytic therapy has changed since Freud. For one thing, analyst and patient usually sit face to face. But analysts still use dream analysis and some other Freudian techniques. 
One is free association. Patients simply state every thought that comes into their heads, no matter how irrelevant. One thought leads to another, and another, and another, and the analyst often detects in this sequence a pattern which hints at unconscious problems. Another technique is transference. If, for example, the patient's unconscious conflicts are with the mother, the patient may transfer the conflict onto the analyst. In effect, the analyst becomes a substitute for the patient's mother, and the patient can act out all the repressed, painful feelings of the conflict. When they express these feelings, many patients have new insight into themselves. Psychoanalysis often takes years. During this time, the analyst provides interpretation of the patient's past. This interpretation gives patients an insight into lifelong problems. This insight may help them understand why they suffer as they do. But it must be used to work through current conflicts in day-to-day -day living. But does this therapy really work? The effectiveness of psychoanalysis has long been debated. Freud psychotherapy is based on a medical model. Psychoanalytic interpretation is like a medicine which helps the patient by creating insight. But how do we know if the medicine has helped? Normally, psychologists rely on objective tests to measure the success of a technique. But psychoanalysis involves subjective interpretation. If the patient gains insight, the analyst may call the therapy successful. But some psychologists evaluate therapy's success by changes in behavior. One study of behavior change compared two groups of patients undergoing therapy with a control group receiving no therapy. The no treatment group showed as much behavioral improvement as the others. But as to insight gained, the study didn't measure insight. Psychoanalysis may also take years to complete and cost thousands of dollars. Today, many people look for faster, cheaper help. But many others still want to deeply explore their personal pasts. And for them, psychoanalysis may work. By the middle of the 20th century, psychoanalysts were treating thousands of people with neurotic problems. But for many people with more serious problems, like severe depression and schizophrenia, psychoanalysis was ineffective. Other methods were needed. It was a time of great faith in science and technology, and science and technology provided some new physiological approaches. The prefrontal lobotomy, designed for dangerously violent patients, was developed as a surgical method of psychotherapy. It was a fast and simple operation in which the doctor severed some of the nerves connecting the frontal lobes to the rest of the brain. The hope was that this would end the patient's violent behavior. But the operations turned out not to be an effective cure. The psychiatrist who invented the lobotomy received the Nobel Prize and also later a fatal gunshot wound fired by one of his supposedly nonviolent lobotomized patients. Public outrage halted most lobotomies. Lobotomies treated problems rather crudely by making it impossible for patients to think or do much of anything. Slowly, the practice of psychosurgery was refined, but it still treated psychological problems by operating on the mind's physical organ, the brain. By the 1950s, psychosurgeons hoped to achieve much better results with a different method electrical stimulation. Surgery on monkeys had taught them how to implant electrodes in the brain. Research on human subjects showed that psychotic symptoms could be relieved by electrical brain stimulation. So they implanted an electrode in a schizophrenic's brain, in the part they thought produced her symptoms. The patient had been pronounced incurable. This film eloquently testifies to her hopelessness when treatment began. She received only one stimulus. And six months later... Have you had any thoughts from anything which has been disturbing you? Mm -mm. 
After 15 months, her progress seemed incredible. So, and they don't feel bad about it. Yeah, and, and the coffee felt sour. Sounds like you did pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> I get by. I get by. <laughs> but two years later, she wept as her schizophrenia slowly returned. This time to stay. The experiment ultimately failed. But multiple stimulation in other patients produced longer-lasting results. Today, implanted electrodes are still used. And psychosurgeons may still remove parts of the brain which control violence or emotion. But these techniques are only rarely used when all else fails. Today's physiological therapies can usually be done without a scalpel. These doctors are about to treat a woman for severe chronic depression. They will deliver an electric shock to her brain. The treatment is called electroconvulsive therapy, ECT. The electric shock will relieve the woman's depression, but it will also produce convulsions in her body. She's been given a muscle relaxant to minimize the convulsion. In the early days of ECT, the shock-induced seizures often broke a patient's bones. When all is ready, for one full second, the current is applied. The patient is quiet, except for the convulsive twitching of her toes. She feels no pain. After 90 seconds, the twitching is over. The doctors administer oxygen, because for the next few minutes, the patient will need help to breathe. But after that, she will rest briefly, and then go home, about 30 minutes after treatment began. No one knows why ECT makes some depressed people feel better, but it does. And some psychiatrists prefer it over any other treatment. But there are problems. Every ECT patient suffers a memory loss that may last weeks after a series of treatments. So controversy over shock treatments continues. And there is also controversy over another, even more successful treatment of the mind through the body. This is a drug therapy clinic at a New York hospital. The patients are manic depressives. People whose moods swing from extremes of hysteria to depression. They're waiting for their doses of lithium carbonate, a drug which controls these violent swings of mood. Lithium is an incredibly successful treatment for manic depressive symptoms. It helped 80% of one group of patients. It's only one of dozens of drugs psychiatrists use to chemically treat psychological problems. They prescribe tranquilizers for mild disorders like anxiety. And special antipsychotic drugs for serious ones like schizophrenia. And they use a wide variety of others to combat various levels of depression. Often, they prescribe a combination of drugs and counseling therapies. When administered properly, these drugs can help, particularly if they're used as part of a complete treatment plan. But critics point out that almost every drug has dangerous side effects. Lithium takers must have their blood chemistry continuously analyzed. If they get too much lithium, they will die. Many antipsychotic drugs cause seizures and low blood pressure. And every year, dozens of people die from careless or intentional overdoses of their favorite tranquilizer. The critics also say that physiological therapies often sidestep problems instead of solving them. They claim that psychiatrists who use them only treat the physical symptoms and ignore the psychological cause. 
They insist that despite their high success rates, physiological therapies impose an inaccurate model on psychotherapy. They claim that the mind can't be treated like the body. And they champion a radically different approach to therapy. In 1952, America was electing Dwight D. Eisenhower president. And some American psychologists were developing a new and distinctively American therapy based on the principles of humanism. Humanism was a rebellion against the medical model of psychotherapy. People aren't laboratory rats, said the humanist. They shouldn't be shocked or cut open or drugged. They are unique individuals and they ought to be treated that way. So humanism returned to the Freudian emphasis on intra-psychic conflict. But it reversed psychoanalytic techniques of therapy. In humanism, the therapist doesn't tell the patient what's wrong. The patient works out the problem with the therapist's help. Okay. What are you going to start this morning? Well, I don't know. I, w I was thinking that when we, t when we talked earlier about the the anger, mm -hmm. I've been thinking a great deal about that. One type of humanistic therapy is called client-centered. The patient is called a client because patient implies a medical model. The therapist's job is to help clients understand what they themselves are saying, thinking, and feeling. Here, for example. I guess my mind uh, academically or something, you know, and something other than emotion or whatever like would like to tell me that I'd like to uh, to not be angry and to skip over that part if that's a part of the process, you know? I think I get that, but your, your mind is taking the place of the system and saying, uh, uh, play it right, do the right, do the proper thing. Right. But some other part of you is saying, yeah, but there's some anger there. For sure. For there's sure. Some anger. Right. The therapist is Carl Rogers, a humanistic psychologist. In the dialogue we just heard, he illustrated one of the fundamental techniques of client centered therapy. He became a mirror for his client's thoughts, restating them face to face in a friendly, uncritical manner. Rogers believes that the mirror experience releases the client's innate drive to heal his own psychological ills. His philosophy is at odds with psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysts are usually physicians. Psychoanalysis maintains the doctor-patient relationship. The patient describes the symptoms. Then the analyst diagnoses the condition by exploring the patient's past. The analyst tells the patient what's wrong and how to get well, according to the patterns of neurotic conflict described by Freud. The psychological problem is like a case of the flu or a broken leg. The patient is in the doctor's hands, and the doctor always knows best. On the other hand, humanistic therapists are usually psychologists, not physicians. They tend not to tell their clients anything, except what the clients have already told them. Their approach is non-directive. The clients must decide what their problems are and how they must be solved. The therapists only help. They don't impose judgments on their clients. They try not to ask about the past. They attempt to clarify their clients' present situations and future goals. They trust their clients to discover themselves and heal themselves in the atmosphere of warmth and support that therapy creates. For humanists, self-healing means self-acceptance. Clients must acknowledge their genuine feelings, especially their genuine regard for themselves. But does humanism work? Humanists claim that their clients are the only people qualified to judge their improvement. 
But critics point out that humanistic therapy inevitably influences the client to discover qualities the therapist approves of. Many people swear that only the warm support of a humanistic therapist could have helped them take the first steps towards a healing self-discovery. Susan insisted she didn't need a therapist. She only wanted a friend. But when she talked to a therapist, he seemed to be a warm, caring person who sincerely wanted to help her. So Susan found the friend she wanted and the therapist she needed in the same person. And many psychotherapists would agree that successful therapy may depend more on that combination than on the type of therapy. If you're considering psychotherapy, you'd want to keep in mind what Susan found out. In the 1950s, psychologists concluded that about 90% of all people who develop mild psychological problems recover within five years, even if they never get help. That's spontaneous remission. It adds one more option to your already difficult choice. Should you try psychoanalysis, humanism, or a therapist who combines several techniques, or just hope for spontaneous remission? And who's the therapist that's right for you? Now, only you will know. But whatever your choice, you should make sure your therapist is qualified for counseling. Patients with really severe mental disorders don't have any choice. Psychiatrists prescribe treatment for them. But most of us are on our own. We simply have to try various therapies and therapists until we find what's right for us. That isn't easy. But if it leads to a happier life, it's worth it.